So today on the Human 24 Live On Form podcast, we are joined by Jenny and Wayne. Jenny and Wayne, how are you doing? Good, We're really thank good. You. How are really? you? I'm all right. Uh, I'm surviving. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what the, 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 nice the kind of British thing to say, isn't it? It's, it's sort of, I'm, sur- I'm doing okay. I'm surviving. Yeah. Oh, but, right. it's, but saying that, though, I think it's probably the... It's nice in a way because I think people are, are, are generally honest now. You go, how are you? And they go, I'm surviving. <laughs> <laughs> could be better. Could be better. So, so yeah, yeah, exactly. We're in the midst of a lockdown. Uh, obviously, we, this might not go out. Uh, fingers crossed, we might be out of lockdown by the time this goes out. But at present, as we speak, we are locked down. We're, 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 we're stuck at home. You know, how are you guys coping? It's been good. We moved house in the middle of the pandemic, um, which was amazing because it was like a breath of fresh air and a new project. We felt like we got a new energy. We moved into central London. We got to walk in Regent's Park and Primrose Hill every day and change our routine up. So it's been, I think we're lucky. It's been okay. It has been good. Um, and when we moved in as well, because it's an old Victorian house, so we inherited this basement, and it was <laughs> something from a horror film. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> you walk down, and it's like, okay, it was get out. Out. <laughs> <laughs> So, was... so that's been good in sort of certain for me, and kind of working on that, and and turn it into Jenny's walking wardrobe. <laughs> so, <laughs> Ooh, on the basement floor. Yeah. Are you joking? I don't know whether you're joking here, are you? Or are you no, no, no. So, so um, where we are in, in Queen's Park, um, a lot of the houses, they have basements. And the basements used to be like the old boiler boiler room for for the entire property. Um, but what they did, they, they obviously gutted it. And the people, when they kind of refurbished the house and everything, the one thing they didn't do was the basement. So when you, walk, when you went down there, it was just in a horrible state. Um, and I don't know if you see sometimes in around London, you have like these um, small round drain covers yeah. uh, and they have like little insignias on them. So we have one outside our, we need to look at the history of it, but outside the house. But what happens is that when it rains, all the water then comes in through the drain cover and into the basement. Uh, so sometimes you go in there and it's like this little pool of water. Not anymore. Um, not anymore. Because we tanked it and painted it and uh, made it beautiful. Yeah. And now it is like a walk-in wardrobe. So that was a fun project That's for about a month. <laughs> for- Sounds like a great lockdown project, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, no, it really, it really was. So that that came to, kept us entertained for, for quite a bit. But alongside that, I mean, we've had clients as well to deal with. Um, certainly for me, outside of uh, personal training and, and fitness, um, you know, acting as well. So... There's been a lot of auditions and you know a few projects having to work on, so it's been good. And then we've cool. trained hundreds of hours online, like all our clients shifted, and then we deal with a lot of like CEOs, private equity guys, and instead of them traveling all the time, they've been in the UK. Mm-hmm. So we've had much more consistency with training with clients. So no one's going on holiday, no one's going away. Mm-hmm. I think that's been the case everywhere, though, hasn't it? I think a, a lot of almost businesses have, have, have un, kind of adapted, but then also found out that a lot of people can actually function very well from home and do what they need to do from home, right? Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. especially with what we do, we're bringing health and fitness into someone's home in a safe way. And especially in the first lockdown, we all closed our doors, locked them, and didn't want to even let the Amazon guy in. <laughs> um, so I think we were a really refreshing part of all our clients' day because you're coming with like bags of energy. Both of us refused to talk about COVID. Um, so it would be, you know, you bring something super positive and for yourself into your home that was safe for a change. Amazing. And and we have got a million things to talk about. There are there's so many avenues beyond our basement. <laughs> hey, look, look, it's hey, the basement's interesting because it, <laughs> yeah, there was just a little knock from the basement there as well. I think the ghost wants to come in. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. Well, no, we won't get into that. The kind of things you find in basements, but anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, you. You two are so interesting with respect to history, with respect to what you do now, with respect to what you've done in the interim and and, and everything. And, and obviously we 
we get people on on the podcast that have this kind of outlook. They have this great mindset. They have this uh, kind of history. You know, movement is a large part of what they do. Uh, you know, they, they they're into health. They're into well being. They're into all of that stuff. Now, now to find one person that kind of does that is is incredible. Mm-hmm. But to find two people in the same roof who kind of live that on a day to day basis, but not only that, but have done it for so long. It's it's pretty incredible. So I kind of want to start at the start with you today. And I, want to, I want to go right the way back to, to when it was Junior Wayne and Junior Jenny. And <laughs> where this all kind of stemmed from. And and I know I know bits of it, but I think it would probably just be best if I just threw it out to, to you guys and sort of you tell me where it all started. Can I just on, throw in there on, also that Wayne turned 50 this year? Last oh, you year. did you like to <laughs> From 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 a mental man here, I can see why she wants to tell people you're 50. Yeah. <laughs> because nobody will believe it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. but, but the thing is, it doesn't just stop, it's like strangers. You know, it's just like, hey, you know, it's like, I'm like, you don't have to tell the world. Come on. It's all right, how are you? Oh, wait, 50. <laughs> no. No. Hey, I can see why she'd want to tell me. I mean, you've got, <laughs> but you've got to be happy with that, right? You've got to be happy. That totally. You turn 50 totally. And you're like, you know, you're, you're, you're as well as you are. You know, you're in great shape, clearly. You, you know, you're doing so much stuff. I mean, an insane amount of stuff. And you're doing things that, that really, you know, most people would be looking to do probably when they're in their 30s or even their 20s, right? And, and is, yeah. it, is this down to the fact that you don't feel like you're 50? I'm assuming so, right? No, no, far, far from, far from. Um, it's interesting because um, I'm actually listening to um, an, a, a, an audio book at the moment by Ken Robinson, uh, and it's talking about finding your element or your element. So it, it's basically... You know, it, it's not just about your talent, it's about your passion for things that you want to do. And most people in life spend the time trying to find what the talent is, or they've given up on trying to find what their talent is. And for me, right from, you know, a very young age, it's like there's always, you can always master new things and learn new things. Uh, and so, you know, in my 50 years on this planet, it's okay, yes, I've joined the military, I've represented, you know, Great Britain. Uh, international, you know, uh, sport. Uh, I've worked for the police. I am now an actor. We have a business together. So it's constantly finding things and being in your element that that will keep you going. I, I think life really is kind of very linear for most people. You go to school, you finish school, you go to college, you finish college, you go to university, you get a job, you find yourself a partner, you get married, you have kids, you retire job done you know and most people live that linear path and i think there's there's more really that can be had and you know it's it's you know for us when we personal train and you know yourself as well you're saying to people you know you need to step outside your comfort zone you know and you you know every time you step outside that comfort zone you discover something beautiful uh so for me that's that's how it is and i think really that's what kind of keeps me where i am right now and also being with jenny she's super competitive so almost everything we do is competitive it could be down to making things like scrambled eggs in the morning you know it's the best best scrambled eggs who's the best at scrambled eggs i'm the winner (laughs) I'll accept that fact from you there when it was kind of like yeah she's got a point (laughs) (laughs) well we we the convers the the competition went a little bit too far one time because on a friday we used to have mojito friday uh and we had we invited some friends around and um so i made the first mojito and was like hey how is it and they're like it's really good and jenny was like really so she made a mojito but i call it pacey portions so if it says you know one shot jenny will do three because it's going to be better um and i think after jenny's um mojito making skills she destroyed so yeah i won on that one 
Okay, so 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 one of I'm sure as the conversation goes on, we'll find some more scores coming in. Coming yeah, in. so it's one one now. So competition, the spice of life. Yeah. yeah so, so this is interesting. So so obviously you've this is the way that you've looked. Well, you look at things now clearly, Wayne. This is the yeah. perspective that you have now. Has that perspective always been the same? Have, have you you know when you were, when you were young? Because obviously you know you, you've competed in 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 very high level sports in in multiples of disciplines, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and and you know you've been in the military, which again takes a mindset of its own. I think in you know to to do that and and to be part of that and that process that, that involves going into the military. And then you said you'd done bits for the police force, and then now into acting, and and and, and there's there's some really tight correlations there between sort of your history and your background and, and Jenny's as well, you know, because Jenny, where, you know, where did it start for you and where, where's your mindset at now? Uh, you know, there, there's so many similarities between where I see both you from a mindset perspective and obviously the journey that you've both been on. So where did this all start for you, Jenny? So I came from Lincoln, which is a little town up north. And I remember from being a little girl feeling like it was far too small for me. And there was not much to do, so I threw myself into sports. And I think I felt a great deal of boredom and being restrained. And within sport, I felt like anything was possible, anything was achievable. And I felt the correlation and saw the correlation between how hard I worked and then how far I could progress. It, it was super linked for me. So I did gymnastics, horse riding, um, hockey, football, netball, track and field, like every night of the week I was doing something different. And maybe around the age of 12, I realized I couldn't be um, an elite swimmer, horse rider, gymnast and track and field athlete. So I started to hone the process um, and focused on athletics. I went to Loughborough University, which was where I got my first international vest. And it was there, I was surrounded by Linford Christie, Sally Gunnell, incredible elite athletes in an incredible setting. And got a new coach, a training partner, Caroline Pierce, who ended up being in Gladiators too. And it was then, I suppose, my world got dialed up and really opened um, in terms of my training, what I could do physically and what was possible and the scope of my dreams. And then from there, I was asked to trial for bobsleigh uh, in 2005. And because they were bringing some athletes over from heptathlon because we had the speed, the strength, the power yep. and the durability. So they brought some sprinters through, but they found that they were quite fragile um, whereas the multi-eventers tended to have the speed and the strength, but not break down as easily. So the World Champs was my first race in Canada, and that's when we ended up meeting. Um, Wayne, I didn't like her. You didn't like her at all. <laughs> I, was, yeah, but I was 21 at the time. No, you weren't. You're old. I was 21, 22, you know, 22. And I was a bit of a pain in the bum. She was. <laughs> I'm glad like you said it. <laughs> in what way? Just okay. Uh, no, in lots of different ways. I'm, I'm going to give you one example. So, um, Prince Albert of Monaco was. It was also a, a, a bobsledder as well. So I am going to tell a story. <laughs> so I think he should be known. But Jenny had this thing. It's like if I can wrestle a man, then he's weak, and I'm not interested. And then so Prince Albert's like really. And then before I know it, there's a scuffle. There were two bodyguards that were panicking, like, <laughs> what the hell do we do? And I'm like, what's going on? I could hear this. <laughs> and Jenny had him in a headlock. And we're, and we're like, Jenny, you need to stop. You need to stop. And the bodyguards were like, is it a game? Or what do we do? What do we, you know? So I'm like, Jenny, please let him go. It's okay. <laughs> so these were like some of the things that she would, she would do. I, I think I was just a little bit boisterous. And <laughs> I had a lot of testosterone and I quite enjoyed external attention. I needed a lot more external validation at that point. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, putting Prince Albert in a headlock was 
part of that process. That's a, yeah, that's a that's an accomplishment. Royalty. <laughs> I've been royalty out at the age of 21. <laughs> Why is this not in any of the bios that I've read? I'm, 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 it's all coming out. Yeah, it's all coming out. <laughs> so, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig a little bit deeper into that because you said, look, look, I was a little bit boisterous. I was a little bit, you know, obviously chasing a bit of attention and, you know, uh, where did that stem from? Is that is that the little town thing? Is this the little, uh, you know, or was was this something yes. at that particular time of your life? Was it? Was it <laughs> when, I, I, I um, I've been it. Uh, I started doing a therapist in my thirties to kind of figure out these questions. Okay. Um, because I spent a lot of time attention seeking and being a little bit too boisterous. Um, and I think honestly, it comes down to not being enough. Um, so it's, it's that question I think a lot of people ask themselves or feel about themselves. I am not enough or am I enough? Um, and it was a good way to distract myself, uh, from that process, I suppose, because when you're the limelight, you're in the middle of everything, everyone's going, oh my God, you're great. And being interested by you, you don't maybe have to work into yourself or find out more about yourself. Um, and I think definitely in my early 20s um I, I was very pleased to distract myself with sport and competition and attention and everything I could that was exciting around me so did, was that was that an internal thing or was that an external was that peer pressure was that parents was that where where do you think that stemmed from was that was that just something that you were constantly critical over where you were so you know you, you succeed at something and then you look at it and kind of you don't celebrate it you just sort of look at it and go well that's not enough, what's next? Yeah, and I think as a sports person, um, especially when you're younger um, and you haven't maybe found as much peace, and I was super driven by winning and um, that feeling of accomplishment and being better all the time. And I think as a sports person with training sessions, you have a great way in life to be better all the time because you get to lift heavier you get to sprint faster you get to beat different people in training so sessions your performance you, was actually being exposed and doing better all the time yeah. yeah and then you would long jump further your times would get better in bobsleigh like there's a, a so many mechanisms for you to prove to yourself or show yourself that you are constantly better and evolving um and so it became a big external thing. And then when I turned 30, that's when I retired. And I was like, okay, so I'm not going to be distracted in this way so much. Um, I'm not going to be hitting PBs anymore. I'm not going to be cleaning, you know, personal best in the gym. I'm not going to be doing personal best in a long jump. So that's when I was like, okay, I need to find some peace and understand all of this stuff a bit more. Okay. And then that's when I started meditating every day. Um, and just working in more to feel better out more. Okay. And uh, how was, so you said, you said, I think that I, I don't want to quote you exactly there. And, uh, <laughs> you said she was a pain in the ass, did you say? <laughs> you did quote her. <laughs> yeah, thanks, yeah, thanks for that reminder. Uh, so you said it, she was a pain, right? So, could you relate to this? I'm, I'm intrigued as to, because obviously the initial impression that, that maybe Jenny gave you wasn't really what you were looking for. It wasn't certainly something you were drawn to by, by your comments there. So, so is this something, could you relate to Jenny at that point and think, yeah, I was a bit like that? Do you know what? Yes. Because, and, and I'll tell you for why, and Jenny kind of has explained it really nicely there. And I think when you come from, a sporting background you have your your growth mindset so you're always if you didn't perform well you kind of you analyze it and you go okay yeah. what did I do well and you break it all down and then you improve it and you find ways to improve it um so yes it's like if, if you perform well and you did a pb or you ran the fastest time or you finish first or second you kind of go yes and then you look and go more. So that's that's validation itself. And then you you become this little peacock when you sort of you know you fluff up your chest and you're you know and you want to be noticed. And 
I think, you know, team sports, more so individual sports, you want that validation constantly. You're searching for it. And, you know, sometimes you're the loudest person in the room because you're on a high, you know, the endorphins are, are bouncing around. And then, you know, the next day something happens and then you're like, mm, okay, what can I do? Okay, I didn't perform so well, but I'm going to make everyone notice that I'm here, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's it's interesting as well that that same growth mindset, it, it's like that's translated into acting as well because, um, you know, acting's the same thing. You know, you, you, you're you doing your auditions and you may not get the job and then you, you want to break it down as to find out why you didn't get the job, you know. And a lot of the time it is probably nothing to do with what you've done. It's just it might be the fact that the other person, they like that person because they've got hair, no Actually, facial hair. You know, it's, it's it? different. Because it's not always about your ability at no. all. But you, you can I think from an athlete point of view, you, you still want to break it down and analyze it and write, okay, next time I want to do things slightly differently. So you, you constantly, and then when you get a job, it's like the best feeling in the world and you want everybody to know. But then Jenny takes it over because she's like, okay, not only is Wayne 50, but he's got this job that he's working on next week. I'm like, I'm really proud of you. I love you, Wayne. And then, and this so, so there is that trend, yeah, that that transfer from being an athlete into the everyday life as well, you know, which is which is really good. And this is really interesting with you two. And this this is something that again from the you know sort of background of you know what I know about you and and you know I've met you many years ago, both of you, and, you know, and just very in a very quick manner, and you know we we carried on doing our thing. But one of the intriguing things is that you come from these points of almost uh, being at the top of your game in many different fields, right? And you've been from these points of adoration, these points of being hugely successful in what you've done. But that's carried on. And what I've, you know, what witnessed to with, certainly with professional athletes, is that professional athletes kind of peak, they retire, and then they have this either mindset shift or they just kind of, they just give in. They, they, they're sort of, they're done with it and they've, they've pushed, they've reached their peak. They're quite happy. They're content with, with everything. And then, then all of a sudden there's this, this shift to now I'm just going to get on with normal life. Whereas with you two, you've, you've taken that same mindset and you know what you, you, you pinpointed there when as this growth mindset and, and another thing, as well is that with professional athletes, I've always found that professional athletes have real problems with celebrating wins. They have a real issue with going, well done me. They yeah. might, you know, like you said, they might parade around like peacocks, but ultimately in the back of their mind, they're still going, right, what next? And what, what can I do better? And they have real issues with, with celebrating, you know, phenomenal achievements. And they kind of go, mm -hmm. oh, I'm just going to move on. But what's intriguing about you two is you've carried on with this mindset and this, this approach to life and this approach to events and approach to projects or whatever it might be. And you've carried on with this, this same mentality that you probably developed when you were very young. And, you know, you were doing your sport at school and turning up to every single known sport, you know, <laughs> possible. And, and the same with you, Wayne, is that it seems to have carried over all the way through to where you are right now. And along the way you've done all these incredible things so from meeting how long are we looking at until you two kind of got together or decided that or when you decided that she's not a pain and actually really like you know <laughs> we might progress to something else so, so when did that occur no you know what it's um so although uh, yeah i say she was a pain she was a pain but it was a reflection of myself as well i was a cute pain you were a cute pain but <laughs> i think i think at the time because I, I was quite focused on the sport and and this is what can happen sometimes is that you know if the love for what you do or your element you you know when you found your element and you've got the passion and the talent for what you do sometimes you create a bubble and you can't see beyond that bubble uh, and then it just takes that moment for someone to kind of pop the bubble and to expose what's outside of that. And that's pretty much what happened here. So we, we sat one evening and we, we had probably two, three hours. We were just talking and just talking about life in general. And it was from there I realized, actually, she's... This more was on than, the last night in Canada. It was, yeah. 
you know, I'm actually both... picturing you both here in 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 uh, you know head to toe spandex. Some kind of like picnic table, you know, snow <laughs> everywhere and blah blah blah. Maybe I'm wrong, but but that's that's the picture I've got in my head. Is, they, but, <laughs> no, we're, we're wrong with that. We're wrong with that. In, in full was this, life. Was this, a Bob Slay moment? was this a Bob Slayer moment? Yeah. So this was this, during the Bob Slayer was, years. The last party at the World Championships. Um, we we both talked about it afterwards and we said it felt like we got smacked with Cupid's bow and it was that realisation of, oh shit, actually, I think I quite like him. Um, and, and we both described it in the same way at the same time. Mm. And then a year later, I moved to London um, and we ended up going on a date. After can I, can I just say, right, so I'm really bad at picking up messages, so, you know, so... Jenny was like, text me, I'm moving to London. I'm like, hey, great. Yeah, maybe we'll catch up when you're in town. And she kept messaging me. And I think it was at the, the latter breaking point. You're like, look. Are you taking <laughs> me to dinner or not? <laughs> <laughs> I got the message then. But... No, why did you manipulate that story to say, oh, I was just playing cool or something like that? <laughs> when in fact, you're yeah. terrible at getting back to it. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm just, I mean, even, even down to line, I'm terrible at line because it's it's one of those black adder moments. You walk away and you kind of go, why didn't I just say that? You know, <laughs> but yeah. Um, but when she moved in, when she moved in, I was at a house at the time because I was working for the police and they um, gave me, because I was traveling quite a bit. So they gave me a, a house, which I looked after and it was a five bedroom house. So I looked after and uh when Jenny moved to London, she was like, she stayed with her ex-boyfriend's best friend for a while and she found somewhere. I literally like put all my stuff in my car. Um, I, I'd come it back. Quite, it was quite a, it was, a, a, a So like a I was a reserve for do. the 2006 Olympics and I'd finished my degree in my PT course and it all sort of accumulated. And I came back to England um, and was a bit like oh, what do I do um I'm going to move to London and see what happens with personal training start a business modeling presenting acting let's just go and do follow my dreams mm -hmm. so we met after a week had a date and I moved in like when instead of my ex-boyfriend's best friend temporarily and I was kind of saying like oh I need to find a flat share or when he's like why don't you just move in with me Wait, got five wait, 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 so I was wait, like, well, why I was like, got five bed <laughs> bedrooms. I mean, at this point, we, we weren't official. Um, but she moved in, went into the largest room, and the room that I thought she was going to take suddenly became her walk-in wardrobe. So she's still <laughs> looking for somewhere <laughs> to... <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the moral of the story, well, we bought a house after six months, and then we are together still, it's 14, 14 years, years later. Amazing. I feel like that needs celebrated. That that's 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 a huge mantle that. Well, and Anna was a pain in the bum at 23, 23. when all this was <laughs> going on. <laughs> so, <laughs> things have progressed. So so along this, along this way, so so you met. You you moved in very swiftly. You've clearly got on like house on fire since then, and and along the way, there's there's been a few things that you've kind of ended up doing together. Was that was that intentional? So so gladiators, was that intentional? No, not really. I mean, the, what happened was well, we, pursued fact, it we, we pursued it together. Yeah, let me just so move that. Um, um, so gladiators, one of my housemates from Loughborough University. Uh, was the accountant at Sky and she called me she's like Pacey they're bringing gladiators back you would be incredible as would Wayne here's the producer's details send your um, video and your CV and your photos so we sent it all in and we were both rejected and then a week or so later I had a phone call on the landline which is unusual and we don't normally, we, don't normally yeah. we didn't have many calls on it and someone from Sky called and asked for Wayne and I was like Who's calling that I call one of the producers at Sky were looking for a few more gladiators would like him to come and audition. 
And I was like, you can't have him without me. I must be at this audition as well. We kind of the package. <laughs> so we both went to contender auditions, but under the premise that we may become gladiators. Um, we, or I got the highest score of the day in a number of physical challenges of every man and woman. Okay, so and can, I, can, I, can I just justify that? Okay, because <laughs> you're going to say that's 2-1. So yeah, Jenny's in the lead. I'm, I'm not keeping score, but yeah, that's two one. <laughs> okay, I, I'm, I am just in case. <laughs> so basically, what happened on the uh, <laughs> on the audition day? So we all split up into groups, and there were like I don't know, fifteen ten. people, 10, 15 people in each, each group. group, and you have a number, and then there's ten or fifteen. Um, different physical challenges like yeah. uh, medicine ball throw, triple sprints, jump, springs, springs, you know, all, all manner of things. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not like gladiator events, they're actual fitness kind of. But, yeah. yeah, yeah. So real, yeah. So it kind of tests you really strength, speed and agility, power, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the group that I was in, so all the, all the, you know, the, the criteria were laid out, you know, you, you needed to throw in order to get, 10 points, you need to throw the medicine ball 20 meters, whatever it was. Um, sprint, do a, a T-shaped sprint in a set amount of time. So all these are things that we were all pretty good at being being athletes. But for me, there was another black guy in our group, you know, bald head, blah, blah, blah. And we both, literally after the first event, we were both sweating like mad. So Wayne the beer, sweats like a demon. Two minutes into any <laughs> workout, so I'm like... <laughs> um, and this is what happened on this day. So both of us were sweating like mad. Bib, the the number fell off the top. So at the end, um, on the the events that I, in fact, all the events, maybe bar one, I would say I, you know, meet the, met the criteria and more. Uh, but on some of the events, I'd be marked as zero or a five, uh, maybe one of the ten. Um, so and we got back to the end, and when all the they were calling out, okay, in like order, sit in school in your little <laughs> pitty shorts and plenty souls. Um, and the yeah. first person they called the out, champion of the day, Jenny Pacey. So, so Wayne looks. Wait, 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 like, wait. So this this is what I've had to deal <laughs> with. Can you imagine? So, like, your name didn't get called out. <laughs> Bear in mind, you thought, you know, I thought I'd outperformed everyone in the group that I was, I don't know about the other groups, but the group that I was in. Um, so and then the first name, the first name out. I'm like, okay, second, second name that's going to be called is going to be Wayne. No. Third name's got to be Wayne. No. <laughs> Fourth name. No. Fifth name. No. Sixth name. No. no, no and that right. was it. <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm on to, six at this point and then you, you haven't got any of them. Didn't make no. it. So at the end, John Anderson so is like, what really? happened? And I said, I have no idea. He says, I thought you did well. I said, I did. But I have no idea what happened. So he went and had a look and he said, well, you clearly didn't because you scored a five, a zero on this. And I was like, I can assure you, I didn't score a zero. And he's like, why didn't you challenge it? I'm like, how can I challenge it? Because I don't see what scores they're doing because you don't want to go up to the person and go, show me my score, show me my score. Yeah. And he's like, well, you didn't contest it. So there's nothing I can do for you. And then I had to sit <laughs> on an hour's journey with Jenny doing that, ringing everybody, going, guess what? Guess what? How did Wayne do? Um, um, <laughs> but anyway, let's talk about me. <laughs> but, but then, so I had the second round of trials with all the potential female gladiators. And we did some wrestling, some more physical trials, and then on camera, like personality profiling to find out what kind of character yeah. they would give you. So that went really well. I got given the role as Enigma and I went in for my contract talk with one of the producers. And so I went through everything. I was like, oh, did you get all the male gladiators? She's like, no, we're looking for a really big black guy and a really big white guy. I was like, funny you should say that. This terrible thing happened in the auditions. Wayne's number fell off and he got muddled up with another guy and blah, 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 blah. She's like, oh, really? I'll look through the tapes and see. So she looked through all the tapes, saw the how... Event, yeah. Ama yeah, saw how amazingly he was. And then he got called back... 
Um, and then you got to be reserved in the first series, yeah. which was lucky because his costume <laughs> was horrendous. It was like it, hot, it was hot pants, pants with, a, with a little nipple guard. Of course, because 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 the, the, the series you were in, it was like the first series was just sort of basic spandex sort of leotard kind of numbers, right? And then it went a bit more edgy, didn't it? More like gladi- yeah. well, gladiators, right? There was a lot more decoration and blah blah blah, yeah. and, right? So yeah, so I was, I was kind of, I was glad. Oh, okay. Say again? You had a cheeky number to wear. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Very cheeky. It's the blue oyster kind of hot pants <laughs> and a little strap. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, so you got away with that one, and then the next one, you got your call. So right? Yeah. So the so although I was a reserve on the first one, so the the for the second show. Um, there was myself and another guy. We had to audition again, which was a bit strange. Um, and I thought, well, you know what? I've got nothing to lose. So I kind of went in with that whole, you know, athlete mindset. That's it. Okay. Um, Jenny's granddad's got this saying, I can, I shall, and I will. And uh, I was like, okay, I'm going to go with that's my attitude for the day. And um, they they separated you into... Six foot, six foot two six to six foot three, uh-huh. and then everything over six foot three and above. Um, and then throughout the day, it, gra- it gradually got fizzled out. And then, so you ended up with a small group and then you had to do, again, it was like real physical uh, challenges. And one of, one of the physical, after I did all the physical, main physical challenges, you had to get together and you do like wrestling, or you did like a pugil stick, but not on a stage, you're just in a circle. And it's the first one to be knocked out. I'm like, right, okay, that's it. I'm going to do this. So I came up against this, uh, like a WWE wrestler. And uh, he was he had another friend with him. They're like, I'm going to kick this guy's ass and that. And so I, I've got a bit of a wrestling background. And uh, so sort of like Greco style Roman wrestling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Um, so I'm like, right, okay, I know, I know my tactics, so I'm gonna do it. So I just kept quiet. And they're like both like, yeah, yeah, yeah. This says, you know, we should be able to wipe the floor clean with anyone. And um, literally went, go. As soon as the whistle went, I like snap, neck snap, grabbed his leg, threw him out. And um, the guy jumped up and he was like, effing and blinding. I was ready, he cheated. Blah, blah. So they went, what, do you wanna do it again? And he went, fuck, oh, right, yeah. And um, so they went, okay, fine. So I went with the same move again. So he went to counter it. So I just grabbed his leg, threw him out. And he was like, Ugh! and he like went off on one. And they were like, okay. Then the second one, I went, I came up against his friend and it was a pugil stick. And uh, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to put my head down and just go for it. So as soon as they went three to one go, I just went down and just get <laughs> working away. And so someone had to like put their hand on and went, Wayne, stop you're done now and I and I kind of put my head up and the guy was like okay <laughs> and um and then the one of the producers was like bloody hell these guys are doomed before they start and then one of them their eyes lit and went love that name yeah let's keep it and that's how it, it came okay, about do. Okay. so sorry our little yeah. dog wants to join oh um <laughs> she's <laughs> she's trying to distract us so I just brought her <laughs> we had uh, the I had a chap on uh, last week and his dog sat the entire, we, we were on for about an hour and 20 minutes and he, his dog just sat there, cool as a cucumber, just just the entire interview, didn't bat an eyelid. Uh, I was like, he's asleep. He goes, no, he's not asleep. He just sat there, just quite content. So is it? We, yeah. we welcome dogs on this show. You're welcome, uh, dogs. Thank you. She's like chirping on. away because she wants to be involved. <laughs> so, so you said they did a, a personality kind of test. Where did... Enigma, explain that yeah. one to me. <laughs> so, I think naturally when I compete, and especially when I wrestle, and I was trying to beat all these women to become a gladiator, and, I, I'm, and my persona is badass. Like, it, it's game face. Um, it's serious. No one's going to take me out. Grumpy. Um, not grumpy, but just very <laughs> determined and very, like... Uh, <laughs> mentality. Um, and yeah, I th- they ended up. Do you remember Justin Lee Collins, the comedian? Yes. He used to uh, work with Chatty Man. 
with Alan Carr. So he was good friends with the commissioner at Sky One. He was like, can I call one of the gladiators Enigma? It came to me in a dream. And they're like, sure, yeah. So this Enigma name came up, mysteriously, oh, mysterious and deceptively powerful were my uh, superpowers. <laughs> and I, I got told he gave me a name and I ended up meeting him at a party with you, like a Sky One press party. And he like wrote his number uh, on a autograph card for me. I was like, thanks, <laughs> I'm with him. <laughs> But Wait, that's where they... uh, hold on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but no, that's how I ended up getting the name Enigma. And we, in the series, we got graded from like the goodest gladiator to the most evil. And they put us in a spectrum when they were doing acting lessons with us. So we sort of knew exactly where we were mm -hmm. in the group. And I was like on the evil end, like <laughs> the bad one at the end. And when were you? With and the bad end. <laughs> <laughs> you, were both, oh, you were both uh wolf esque. Yeah. Uh, he so gave he us some was... tips on how to be um, yeah. badasses. Didn't yeah, he? We he used was, to go yeah, and have a cup of tea with him. Such a nice guy. And and I'm guessing that for you guys, Gladiators was like a big thing, right? You know, the first time yeah. around, the first series got I remember the first series Gladiators, and it was like a it was like a massive thing. It was everybody knew everybody, and it was just just this huge big thing. So for either of you, was it was it almost like a, a bit of a dream to, to to get the gladiator thing? Because it was, you know, it was on its way back. It was this, you know, this second coming of this like enormous thing it was. You know, I remember yeah. when I was, when I was young, it was it was a massive thing, gladiators. And, when um, I was little, or little Jenny, would uh, pull the pillows off the sofa and beat my brother and sister up, pretending I was dueling, and dream of being like Jet and dream of dating Hunter. And if you asked me what I wanted to be when I was like six, it would be, I want to be a gladiator, an Olympic athlete, mm -hmm. and a model, and an actress. It would have been in the host of the things I aspired to be. And then to actually become one was like a dream come true. And then to meet Jet, and then Hunter, and work with all those guys, and Wolf was amazing. Well, it's interesting mean, you said to become, to become one. You've just listed a whole lot of things that you've actually done all of them. And, and <laughs> Wayne has as well, straight <laughs> literally every single thing you've listed there. So so what were the dreams when it, because, you know, you can go back, everybody wanted to be something, right? When they were, you know, when you were a kid, you, you, you had aspirations to be, you know, a space man or whatever it might be. But but along the way, how many of those things uh, were on that list that you've now ultimately yeah, achieved? Yeah, on yours. Gladiator became Enigma. Um, international athlete. I was a reserve for the Olympics, so nearly got there. Um, I wanted to be a jockey, but it was my dad used to own racehorses. Something to do with your height. But then I ended up like five <laughs> foot eleven at the age of eleven, and um, gave up that dream. Yeah, I was like, really uh, a jockey, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no jockey, less at Arab horse racing, but. Um, I wanted to be an actress and I've been in both the Wonder Woman films, various TV shows and commercials. I wanted to be a model. I've been in Vogue, a uh, Tampax campaign, um, <laughs> the uh, Adidas, lots of different super brands. Um, I haven't ticked off becoming a millionaire that I always wanted from being a kid, um, working towards that. Yes, we, there's a lot of similarities. Uh, I never wanted to work for anybody. I never have. Very cool. Uh, um, when, uh, where are you in, in your little sort of... Um, yeah. <laughs> your story's no, different, no, though, my, my Yeah, mine's slightly different. In, in the, not hugely different, but slightly different. Because I remember when I, when I was growing up, I, I you know, loved films. I mean, I, I lived in Jamaica till I was 10, so we grew up on Westerns, The Six Million Dollar Man and Bruce Lee. Um, so, you know, there, there was a thing about, I used to pretend that I was, you know, the, you know, Bruce Lee or the $6 million man. I used to run round or pretend I'm jumping high up onto a wall, run round and then blam, you know, all these sort of things. So I, I wanted to be an actor from, from a young age, but didn't know how to pursue it. And I, and also as well, as you get older, you start to put barriers in the way as to why you can't do those um but for me i was going to be a graphic designer and i remember i was at school 
Okay. And I had a bully and he was going to join the Navy. Um, and so what we had to do was while we we're in school, the, our tutor that, at the time got us to... You, you said that as if it was like, I had an old pair or something like that. You just like, <laughs> yeah. I had a bully. I had a bully. This bully was quite poignant. No, but in he's, your... he is, yeah, he is, he is quite poignant in, in my life <laughs> and where I am today because... So when um, we give school talks and presentations to kids, where he's always, I had a bully, and all the kids yeah. are like, you yeah. had a bully? <laughs> I think, what? I, think, I think people like that play a very significant role in people's lives. I mean, I oh, absolutely, I, yeah, I totally agree. You know, I don't totally agree. I'd, I'd have the mindset or anything like that, and, it, and I think that carves part of that out. And obviously, you know, you're going to get into this, right? Yeah. And I think with bullies as well, it's, it's a reflection of what's going on in their life, and they just, you know, the only way to to deal with it is to, you know, express it on other people. Um, so I don't think it's it's anything bad. I think they just need a cuddle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> well, if you'd offered one, they probably would have. <laughs> nevertheless, so so you, so you you have you this know, so, too, right? But in in my as you know as as a kid and back then, I remember I had to stand up in class and we all had to stand up one by one and say what we're going to do when we leave school. But I had a long list of things I wanted to do. I wanted to be a graphic di- designer, international athlete. Um, I was going to be an actor. I was going to, so I reeled up a, a long list of things. And um, I remember uh, my when I, I stood up and I said all of these things and it went on. And, you know, um, I remember my stepdad, he came home and he gave me a check for one million pounds. And he, he said, you know, hold that. And, you know, at the time I was like, wow, you know, I want to be able to hold a check for one million pounds and say, that's mine. Um, so, you know, and I remember I said this in, in class as well. And my tutor, she looked at me and she said, you know, when you leave school, you need to grow up. You can't have all these childish dreams. And uh, so everyone laughed at me because it, it's a ridiculous comment to make. And I remember sitting down all deflated. And then my bully who sat next to me, he stood up and he said, I'm going to join the Navy. And I laughed at him. I was like, yeah, right. And uh, so he gave me a punch. And he was like, you wouldn't be able to last more than six weeks in the, in the forces. So the next day, I think this was a Saturday I went down to town, bearing in mind I was 15 at the time, and went to the Army Careers Office and said, I want to join the uh, I want to join the Army. And they went, do you know what you want to join? I was like, no idea, I just want to join. I went, <laughs> right, okay. So they gave me a whole load of paperwork to take home for my mom to sign by, forged her signature. Um, lied to her because I had to go to Sutton Coalfield to do a uh, fitness test and a, um, a mental test. And uh, so I, I lied to her. So she gave me the fear for the trains to go to Sutton Coalfield. I remember doing the test passing. They said, well, you know, you've, you've got options to do like the signals. The You know, they gave a long list. And I was like, well, um, how soon is the next intake? And they said, well, September. And I went, yeah, that'll do. <laughs> so that was it. Um, and then went back to, when you know, when I passed everything and I got my certificate after my mum beat me because she found out I lied and forged her signature and everything else. So she publicly beat me in front of all my friends to teach me a lesson. Uh, but I went to school and I just went, look, I'm going to join. And then, yeah, it was probably the, the scariest thing I'd ever done because, you know, at the age of 16, just finished school, joining the army. And it's, it's a whole new world, you know, and you suddenly have to grow up very, very quickly but it, it was a great learning curve because it taught me a lot of things and to, you know, that resilient mindset. So when someone says, you can't do this, it's like, well, it's you can't do it, but there is a way of doing it and it's finding that way. And if you fail, it's an opportunity for you to do it again, but better. Um, so that that's what's taught me over the years. And, and with that mindset, competing in sports, finishing the army, competing with sports, into the acting, um, working with clients, it's been able to translate that into all those different fields. Yeah, it's it, it's interesting because it, both of you seem to be almost almost doing something to, to to prove someone be yourself or someone external almost wrong about what you can do and what you can achieve. It's it's interesting and and, and it's something with you know. I've encountered numerous times on the on the podcast already with with people where they they point everything back almost to to an event or a series of events that have, have created this you know mental approach to everything where they just go out and go right 
if somebody tells me I can't do something, I'm going to either prove them wrong or, you know, I'm going to take it on board and actually probably believe what they say and not bother. And, and it seems like you two have kind of countered that each time and gone, well, you know, I can't do this. And for you, Jenny, it was the, the you know, riding horses, being a jockey. It was all of a sudden, right, somebody tells me I can't do that, which logistically I actually can't. It's nothing to do with skill or, you know, being able to. It's just yeah. logistically, it's like wanting to be a basketball player and be five foot two, right? Logistically, <laughs> it's going to be a struggle. But, but it seems like you've both counted those things throughout your life. So as, as this has evolved, you know, you've moved away, both of you moved away from being professional athletes, you know, and that was professional, right? Both of you were yeah. full-time athletes, right? So full-time athletes, you've, you've gone away from that. You've then moved in and done the gladiator thing, which was, how long did that run for? Two years. Two or three, two or three years. And was that, and again, was that a full-time thing? Was being a gladiator? No. So when we were athletes, we still worked as well. We yeah. had um, our fitness company, Pace and Go. I always had this awareness that being an athlete wasn't the entirety of your life. Yeah. And one injury could take it away. Yeah. And I also wanted that balance of choice. Um, so I, I, I had different choices during the day and worked with different people and wasn't just only in that world. I think it made me a more rounded, better athlete. Uh, and then gladiators. And was this something because of the, 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 the sport? Because obviously professional being a professional athlete depends really on the sport, right? As to as to what their future sort of pans out, and obviously track and field, you were you were in amongst really the golden era of of athletics, right? When you know mm-hmm. the, the Gunnell Cram, you know all of those, you know all of those people were in there, you know shaking up the world of athletics, and you were in amongst all of that. But at the same time, you, you had to have that reality of this isn't going to last forever. You know, I'm not going to be a professional athlete forever. I'm not going to get paid huge amounts of money, which obviously athletics never has been and probably never will be, you know, unless you're a 100 meter sprinter and you're endorsed by a million different companies. But, you know, there's very little with respect to forging out a career and, and, you know, retiring and going, right, that's me done. You know, yeah. you've got to have something kind of in the in the background. And, and this is the mistake I, I see a lot with, you know, footballers and rugby players who get an injury and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I now need to figure out what I'm going to do outside of that. So was that something that you had in mind all the time as to we've got to keep something going here because this firstly isn't going to last forever. There's the the chance we may get injured. And there's also the the time after athletics, which is, you know, everybody gets told what their shelf life is in many respects, don't they? They get told that, you know, the average, average person doing what you're doing will last till 30 and then, the, you know, the new kind of breed of athletes will come in and, and and they'll be there. So was that always in your mind? Was it just this sensible uh, sort of over overreaching sort of factor that you had in your mind and you thought, right, we need to carve something else out alongside this career to, to make sure that our financial future and also, you know, where we're going to go after this is secure? Yeah, I, I'm not very good at just doing one thing or putting all my eggs in one basket. And I tend to pursue what feels good and right. Um, And I don't know, just training every day and just living to train wasn't enough in life for me. I wanted to like develop business, keep becoming educated, like finish my degree, then do further qualifications. There's always, I don't know, uh, evolution within life and as in, and within being a human. And I've never just been good at just only evolving in one way. So it it wasn't even a question. It was just, I can still train four hours a day, but I can still run a business and maybe still fly to three different countries in one month to do different photo shoots. If I work out my diary and my programming and my recovery, and because, like I said, I've only ever worked for myself, I could uh, design my life or design my diary or design my day, design my week. And I just did that for you, 10 years. I think what you, what you did was kept the door open for opportunities. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's, that was key because if you close the door off and just focus on just that one thing and everything is, is all about that, 
you know, sometimes you look back and go, that opportunity presented itself and I could have done it and it's too late and someone else is now doing it. So it was keeping that, maintaining that open door that if opportunity presented itself, you were able to have a go at it. Uh, and I think that's the, the the key thing in kind of where we are now and, you know, being able to do all the things that we've done and continually. So, you know, once we've achieved something, whether it's modeling or, um, you know, uh, acting or whatever it is, there's always something else. And I, that's where an athlete, you know, they never, you know, to come back to what you said earlier, an athlete never fully embrace the success because they're com- they're looking okay well i've done that now what's the next thing yeah you know it's like how can i improve or how can i make that better so you know and that's that's really the fuel that you need to keep going as opposed to okay i've done all of that now i'm just gonna sit back and what well, now <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we we've, we've had some beautiful moments where all of our skills and worlds have collided um, for instance, like with gladiators, our years of training as athletes and then having done some acting work and TV work all came together yeah. um, to, to bring us that gig as gladiators. Mm. Or I had a, a job where I had to hurdle um, for the Olympics for 2012 and was on like buses and billboards around London and around the country. And it took me back to when I was a kid and I used to herd all the rabbit hutches in my garden. Um, So there's there's lots of little things that have happened. Like Wonder Woman recently, uh, we were both the trainers for the Amazons and then I trained Kristen as Cheetah. And all of our experience, so as sports scientists, trainers for the last, what is it, 30 years between Mm -hmm. us, Um, And then our experience as an athlete and teaching people to run properly and improve their movement patterns and your experience as an injury rehabilitator Mm -hmm. all came together for that job. So I I think the world or our worlds are very connected um, and all the pieces come together. Uh, And and again, I I find that really remarkable because, you know, to see you know, certainly a, a couple that, that that have this, you know, divergence of everything coming together. And, and ultimately, you've got this so much crossover with what you do and your, your experience and your background and all these things you've almost collaborated on and done together. And you both yeah. very similar channels, right? You know, you both, mm-hmm. you know, athletics and then then acting and, and all these different things. And it seems like there's this synergy between you that probably you know or maybe wasn't planned out to start with but was just kind of the route that you both wanted to go on which which is like rare it's I I really like the journey um and I really like you being on the journeys with me like we tend to try and share with each other because it tends to be better when we're together And some things are di- separate, like James Bond was Wayne's first film on Skyfall. And you've had lots of experiences and incredible moments in life that have been completely separate. Yeah, but we seem good. to bring each other on the journey when but we the, can. But this is the thing, it's it's constantly evolving and growing together. You know, that's what it is. And um, I think in, in with a relationship, if you have one person that wants to grow and wants to succeed and the other person is not comfortable with it because of fear or whatever it may, then that, that creates a problem. But I think, not I think, but with both of us, we're constantly, okay, you know, I know, I know for me sometimes an, an example is like, I know, you know, if I do an audition, it's, it's not in my, I can do my best and present it yeah. and they might go, okay, Wayne is not for me. I'm going to go with this guy, and I get it because some some actors, include myself, would just wallow. <laughs> Do you know, wallow sometimes. Sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And, and Jenny's like, "Look, it's fine. It's not in your control. So let's go on to the next one." So to have that backup and that support to actually give you a little slap by saying it's not about that, and is the problem isn't you. You've done your best, and it was good. It's just that either someone's slightly better, and there's always going to be someone better, um, or it, you know, as, as one feedback was, it's you were good, but it was just down to character choice that that person just looked differently to uh, and probably fitted more what they wanted. So 
to have that partner with you that's growing with you and evolving with you, it, it's it's a wonderful thing because then the, the there is no boundaries then, you know, or, or limit as to what you can achieve. Yeah. And since we have not been athletes, I think we've trusted in the process much more. So like the right things come to us at the right time and these weird parallels or connections all matrix together to create some incredible experiences and opportunities in our life. Whereas when we were athletes, it was like you forced it and you like had a program and you were like, yeah, yeah. Push, a push, 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 push. Yeah. but since we retired it's like oh, okay now nah, it, it just comes mm. I wish mm. I'd sort of known that more in my 20s I think I think it's a I think it's a process that almost anybody I think who's successful in whatever you know whatever element whether it's business or whatever I think has to go through that almost regimented process to start with before they kind of become a little bit loose with it all and a little bit more relaxed with how the process pans out I know you know myself with training and things like that is is that it becomes more results orientated when you actually probably analyze it less right yeah it's the same process with you know certainly when I've dealt with actors and actresses and and they have this kind of regimented process in which they go through and the second they seem to relax they seem to then sort of fit into these roles and start getting things and they and the magic happens. Them. Yeah, and they don't seem to worry about it as much, and 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 things just you know they occur. And I think I think acting is a fascinating sort of world in that it's it's an opportunist world because you know, like you said, Wayne, I think there's a director or a producer or a casting director or whatever it might be will have a picture in their head of how they expect this character to already look. And yeah. if, if you walk in and you don't look that particular way before you've even opened your mouth or done an audition or anything like that. I think already you're kind of on the back foot. You don't yeah. know it, but I think you already are, right? And that's that's why it's an intriguing world in that it's there is a lot of opportune moments. And I think a lot of it is there's a little bit of luck there. There's a little bit of, you know, everything all mixed in. It, it, it's fascinating. And I think it needs that level of tenacity that you've clearly both got just to persist and persist and persist mm. and wait for that opportunity that will happen. And I think the first time I met you, Wayne, was actually on a, on a casting. I think we were both... We were both, uh, I think we were at the same age. Was it the rugby commercial? It was, well, I think it, we met twice, I think, in, in a matter of weeks. One of them, I think, was a rugby commercial. And then the other one was, a, I think it was for Sky, potentially, where we were in a boxing ring. And it was, <laughs> and I can't remember what it was for. It was, it, it was, it was something in a yeah. boxing ring. And I remember it being in a, and then there was, there was the rugby one as well. And, and anything rugby was always kind of my, you know, I, I just look like a rugby player, right? So it was... <laughs> I was going to say, you guys went for the same part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we all got it. Yeah. And, and I don't think either of us got it. So, so hey, we, we were both wallowing in self-pity or whatever it was. Yeah. <laughs> it was uh, yeah. Come on. But, but yeah, and I remember talking to you then and, and there was this thing, um, you look, I'm, I'm into acting. And I think at that point, you just you'd got a role in something and you were, you know, you're working towards it. And I think there's always that, that perception that when people see actors, it, it almost looks like there's this, there's this thing that you, you're saying, I'm an actor, but for a lot of people, they're actors or they're actresses and they haven't actually had a role in anything. They're just, you know, they're out there, they're auditioning, they're doing all this stuff and, and, it, and it's a lot of hard graft and it's a lot of time. It's a lot of effort. It's a lot of, waiting for that opportune moment right and i think it's it, it's very different to all of the rest of the stuff you've done which all like the sports stuff like the doing the degrees and you know the army it's all very calculated right whereas yeah. now there's this kind of but obviously that's not your main deal right you know your acting is if if it doesn't pan out and you don't get a part it doesn't change your world massively no it? absolutely You've still got a business, right? And and tell me about Pace and Go. So so this is you've had this business for a long time, right? So yeah. we it's pretty much since we've been together. So you know we because at the time I was heading the rehabilitation unit for the Met Police. Uh, Jenny had completed her sports science degree, and it's like, why don't we just start a business together? You know where we can, you know, evolve it over the years. Um, we were trying to get all the little cogs or the little facets to make pace and go what it is. And when we came up with pace and go, I'm like, 
Pacey and Gordon, let's just shorten it and make it pace and go. But it took her about three months to realize what, because like pace and go is so great, pace yourself and go, or, you know, uh, and we came up with all these. And then one of our friends was like, pace and go, that's that's really clever. It's Pacey and Gordon. I was like, oh, oh. it is as well. Like, pace yourself and go. That, that wasn't planned. <laughs> that wasn't he planned I, I planned it, yeah. What a great business name. And I was thinking, Pacey and Gordon, it makes complete sense. And it, <laughs> that wasn't how it evolved. It was, you just picked two kind of words and it just ended up being... Pace, it was Pace and Go, but then um, we found out pay, there is a place called Pace and Go or Pesengo in, in Italy. So mm. people are like sending messages to like, well, we sent you a message. I'm like, no, you didn't. <laughs> and then it'll come up Pesengo in Italy. You know, it's oh. like a little caravan site or something. And you yeah, <laughs> we're like, oh, no. <laughs> so, so, so what is it the business does? Tell me about what the business does. So, so you know, who do you deal with? How do you deal with them? What sort of things do you, do, do you run them through? Because this is obviously the very professional side of what you guys do as a business, right? So we have different arms to the business. Uh, one of the main ones is personal training. Um, and we have a number of clients that we train face to face or on video right now. And um, then we have over a hundred. Then we have over a hundred online programs, and we've done various fitness DVDs. But the main way that we put out our content is on Grokker, which is an American site, and we've got workouts for beginners to the elite athlete we've got desk stretches to thousand rep circuits to metabolic conditioning kettlebells dumbbells the way that we train and the way we would train our clients and we've got a new program launching called turn it up in spring and um, then we are consultants for brands and um, so we'll help create marketing or programming um, we've traveled the world uh, training clients and people on equipment we were both consultants for Andre Agassi and then you've worked for Core Health, Core Health and, and Fitness. Fitness and various manufacturers mm -hmm. then we have motivational services so we go corporately and within schools uh, and deliver workshops motivating kids mm -hmm. we might work with disadvantaged or the very talented um and we go into corporate environments and help people become fitter healthier uh, and improve their wellness within the workspace. What else do we do? Sounds incredibly well rounded. It's, it's, it, you know, and, and this is this is really what we, you know, we talk about. Where you know, we talk a lot about mindset, which clearly is something that both of you worked on and obviously developed and 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 really take advantage of. You know, it, there's just you just ooze positivity, both of you. And, and this, mm -hmm. it's lovely when like, people say that. And, it, and it, you know, whether that, you know, my next question is going to be, is it there all the time? Are there days where you think, mm, not so much, or are there days? And how do you how do you guys deal with that? Is this a, do you bounce off each other? Is it something where, you know, when you get into that bad headspace or you you feel a bit negative or there, there might be some role or something you didn't get? And you, you said before about kind of, uh, you know, dwelling on it and, and worrying about it. Is, is, what happens when you guys get into those spaces? You know what? It's. I think it's just normal human behaviour. You're going to have those days where you're like, meh. Um, you know, you feel like everything's against you. But what's good with... It's very rare that both of us would be in that same space. And if we are, one of us was kind of say, right, enough of that. Let's get out of it and let's find what the problem is and deal with the problem. Um, one of the things I was going to say earlier is that what we've eliminated um, from our way of thinking is fear. So I like to use fear as a, it's a, it's an acronym for fuck everything and run, you know, or forget everything and, and run. Um, so we, we well, try, uh, yeah, <laughs> false evidence appearing real. So we, we try and throw that to one side because fear is is always the the block and everything and we overcome that so we're always there pushing each other on egging each other on if someone's embarking on a new project we we don't try and put that person down we're like right okay what can we do to make things better what can you do to make you stand out in what you're doing or you know what you know so we're always looking at way to encourage each other to do the best or to find another way to get around the obstacle uh, and that's that's been really important for us. 
So we do we do have the occasional kind of meh day where things don't feel right for whatever reason. And a lot of the time it's probably we might just be tired and you know that tiredness is is creating a fog that we can't see beyond it. Uh, and you just need that person on the outside to say, look, everything is okay. You know, so it's good that we we have that. With the personal training, sorry, I was going to say with the personal training, what we've discovered over the years, because I think we're, with training people, initially it's like you need to make a living. And if people come to you, you kind of, you, you right, I want to help you. But in the back of your mind, it's, I need to make a living. I need to pay for my bills, et cetera, et cetera. But what you end up doing is working for the wrong reason. You're working because it's the money's the biggest factor as opposed to wanting to help someone. The, 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 the joy of helping someone achieve their goal. So what we've done is say, right, we only want to work with people that we really believe like. in and really like because it makes the life so much easier. You know, we, we had days where we come home and we're like, this person's done this that person's done that or we both come to yeah you know so we don't have anyone in our life who sucks our energy the necromancers yeah (laughs) we only have people that add to it and we can add to them yeah so we choose really amazing people to be around um we choose to only do what we enjoy like you worked for the Met Police for 18 years and towards the end of it, you did not enjoy it. And it was a wonderful transition to then work together and then go to acting. Yeah. And then, oh, I had another thing in my head. You had another thing you were going to say. (laughs) Um, Oh, and then the other thing is finding the magic and the moments in life where you don't want anything else. We were talking about this the other night the moments where you're so happy you could die and it's being able to tap in to you and other people and finding that and it could be in I was writing down some new year's goals the other day and I've quite there's a big chunk of them that are about my day-to-day behavior which keeps me in a happy positive place or if I end up like you're saying having a day it will bring me back into the good bit okay. and it's things like meditate each day, go for a walk in nature, um, do a workout, make sure I've had enough sleep, um, drink enough water or eat whole foods. They're they're kind of like easy tickables that become a behaviour and then really keep me in the middle or keep me in the good place. And that's really interesting because you've just you've just recited a load of stuff off there in a in a list of things that you would be putting in your New Year's resolutions, which are things that I'm sure that any of the listeners listening to, you know, both of you, you talk about your life and your lifestyle and everything like this, that I would have thought were already ticked, you know? Yeah, well, the, the in complacency or not having an awareness of the little things that you have to do for yourself each day that keep you where you want to be. It's when you lose them, like you start chasing a big job. So on Wonder Woman, for instance, you end up, with a huge amount of hours, much more stress and pressure, less sleep, um, not choosing how you design your day because you work within their schedule. Um, So for instance, after I was on that job for nine months, it was like, okay, I need to almost find my soul again. So I went to Bali for a month. I retrained, did some yoga teacher training um, and then brought in the meditation, brought in some different things into my life just to bring me back into... Uh, myself again having given a a lot for nine months in a very different way yeah I think it's when that routine gets kicked right it's like you know I always talk about people when they you you know when you go on holiday you you forget things even people forget to clean the teeth and things you know (laughs) on holiday because because your routine gets kicked right so so this kind of brings me on to something that I, I wanted to cover with both of you really is that what are the things on a day-to-day basis that you think, you know, you've, you've put into your lifestyle, you've put into your habits, you've put into your behaviours that, that keep you where you are now? You know, you're both clearly very healthy. You both look after yourself. You both have a phenomenal mindset. And, and there's this kind of bubble of positivity that everybody's been talking about bubbles, right? And yeah. you know, bubble of positivity. I would imagine even your dog was super positive about it. Yeah. <laughs> she's chilled out snoring at the minute. She was snoring a little bit. Right? <laughs> <laughs> 
and you've got this bubble, but is there routine there? What, you know, what does your day look like? You know, we talk a lot about morning routines, evening routines, you know, the things that you do with movement and things like this. So what are the things that both of you do on a regular basis? I, you know, when you get up in the morning, is there a pattern of behavior there? Are the things that you do, you talk about meditation, uh, you know, things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I wake up, I think we both wake up every day and the first thought we've trained ourselves to have is today is going to be an amazing day. Today is going to be awesome. That, that, that's it's strange, but it's you know yeah, it's we it, it, roll over and like high five each other, are it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I know. Like, no, I'm not a morning person, but I I would still want that to be my first thought after I've turned my alarm off or woken up. Today is going to be an amazing day. Is there any? Is there is there journaling? Is there stuff where you you write stuff down in the evening? Do you talk about? You, what you're going to achieve in the day are, the, are these things that you you lock into your own mind and go right i know what i want to get done today and do you then progress and do that or is it is it is it more structured is there is there other stuff in there so so for me it's i mean the a lot of mornings I'm, I'm up fairly early but i will if i have a client starting at seven i'll be or 7 30 i'll be up at six because then I give myself the first half hour to either meditate or I have just my time where I can just relax, reflect, maybe make notes of what I'm going to do that day. But it's, it's my thought process before I then start to think about the clients. And then that hour out, then it's breakfast, think about the program, reevaluate the program that I'm going to do with my clients throughout the day. Then I start my day. But usually, mid afternoon it's my time so i will meditate i will focus on my acting um whether it's doing voice work whether it's doing um scripts whatever it is but that's my time so that could be two to three hours in the afternoon before i then start again with my client because I, I think that's important personally to to have your own time where you can just unwind reflect have your own thoughts because especially like now in lockdown you're constantly in front of a screen yeah, yeah. you know and i don't know we, we said this the other day you're, you're in front of the screen and it's almost like you have to work harder to try and motivate the, the person at the other end and you, have you know you have to be or more yeah. colorful or taxing right it's Say again like, it's like presenting it's it's very taxing people don't people don't yeah that. you know you you know, I've done I've done lectures and seminars that, that last six or seven hours, and at the end of it, I'm absolutely wiped out. And people yeah. think, well, you, all you're doing is just talking, mm. you know. But it's it, it it it's very taxing, right? It's and mentally it's, taxing, yeah. You know, and, yeah. and and again, acting, right? You know, it, it's something I've never really experienced, but I can anticipate that, you know, being an actor or an actress in a in a role that's very engrossing, and you have to become this different person or this different character is yeah. mentally hugely taxing oh, oh absolutely and the the bigger the the bigger the role that you have as well that you've got to do the more energy sapping it is you know that the last thing you want to do at the end of the day is just go out or have a drink or some people might just have a drink because it's that their way of unwinding but it, it does sap everything for you and if you're doing that monday to friday you know come the weekend you just want to sleep or, or you know just to have your own time so it's, it's good really through during the day to have that moment to meditate whether it's 10 minutes 20 minutes whatever just to meditate jenny likes to call it walk in nature where she takes herself out with the dog and i i, I leave it because it's nice to have that separation because we work together we live together you know that was, in the same that was place. Kind of my next point was you know do you kind of respect each other's space and realize that you need that 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 moment where you can just be in your own thoughts and you know you can take your own time whether it's meditating going out for a walk whatever it might be or just you know sitting down with a book or doing something which just involves you and your own space and your own head and obviously lockdown has i think has highlighted that for a lot of people is that you know it's very difficult to get away from you know, people that you have no problems being around. It's just that concentration of being in in a space with the same person, irrespective of how you feel about that person. It, you know, it becomes very challenging, right? So you have that mutual respect for each other's space and time and and you do these individual things, right? Yeah, and we we just not, we flow through the day quite well with each mm -hmm. other. 
So you're asking what we make happen in a day. I always look at the beginning, so pre-plan, so I know when I kind of can get a snack in between clients or when I can take the dog for a walk in nature, which is my time where I listen to an audio book and not answer any phone calls and not talk with you. Um, <laughs> you tend to like do your acting work or American accent work like in the bedroom and I know that, like that's his time and he'll go off on his own and have some time. And it's, I suppose, always knowing um, it's absolutely nothing to do with you or a reflection on you if someone doesn't want to be with you. It's just it works nicely mm-hmm. sometimes together and then as nicely to be separate. Um, like when there was no lockdown, I usually have a couple of girls lunches a week, yeah. um, uh, which would be like a time to kick back with the girls and be away from you and have a change. Um, obviously that's gone so now I have girls dog walks for instance <laughs> it's um, I know take away coffee but it, it's just maintaining those things and looking I think looking ahead and knowing what you need to implement to make you feel like you and make you the best version of you I think so it's, it's an incredible dynamic I think it's something that, that a lot of people you know listening to this will aspire to I think it's something that you know I think I think you've clearly developed over the years and, and brought to this this point and I'm sure there's been hurdles and there's been things not literal hurdles but there was I'm actually talking about literal hurdles <laughs> <laughs> you know all these challenges and things like this and obviously you know you've been together 14 years it's obviously something that you've, you've honed and refined and I think it's always fascinating when you talk to a couple who've managed to navigate that and 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 do all these different things and and head off in their own little I say little dreams, but they're, they're the big dreams, right? And I think sometimes I think the, the, there's often that dynamic where one person gets to go after it and the other person doesn't. And I think it's it's, it's amazing to to see both of you kind of going after what you you want to achieve yourselves, and for the it, to have that correlation of you know they're very similar things. So let's just before we wrap up. Let's just talk about Wonder Woman because I'm sure a lot of people will be intrigued by this. So, so you both you were both involved with the training and the you know the the, the, the development of the, the cast, but you were also in the film as well. Yeah, were both you in it? No, 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 just Jenny. Wayne was not. <laughs> I, an apparently, my, my beard was a giveaway. <laughs> do, you, do you want to know? Do you want to know the truth? I did actually look for you in it. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was like, I'm not sure whether Wayne's in this, so I, I was keeping an eye out. I was like, is he going to pop up somewhere and be 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 in this somewhere on the like? It, it wouldn't. It, I, I think there was a, there was a brief moment I could have been in it. No, but you know, the, yeah, it was yeah, given an opportunity, talk about that, but but it didn't it didn't didn't happen. But there were talk that you know I I could have maybe have acted in it, but only in a very small part or maybe in the background. But that that didn't happen. But. I think at the time as well during the filming, I was on another project anyway, so I was helping out with Wonder Woman. So Jenny was my boss in that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, Jenny went away. Uh, she was working with Kristen while she was working with Kristen in Washington, was it? Um, yeah, I was back in the UK working with the Amazons, uh, you know, so developing the Amazons where into, into Amazon. Where, where did you train them all at? Where was, because again, I'm, I'm sure many of the viewers will you know, and the people listening to this want to want to know how this so how does it work when you train the cast of a movie or something like that? How does it work? Were you in the studios? Were you where was this based at? So I was in the first film as an Amazon, and I was put into eight months training um, as part of the role, and then we filmed that in Italy. And then they decided to commission the second film, and I ended up getting put forward by one of the producers had an interview with Patty Jenkins, who's the director. And I explained to her my vision for training the Amazons would be to train them like athletes so that they look the way that they looked because they moved the way that they did. Yeah. And I would teach them to run, to jump, to have speed, strength, power. And that would be reflected to the audience on the screen. And at the beginning of their training, I wrote on the board um, that we'll inspire the world with our beauty and determination. We will run like Olympians with the grace of dancers and the agility of gymnasts. And so from that, I got brought in to head the training for the Amazons and then also create the programme and train Kristen Wiig 
as cheetah. But if we start with the Amazons, um, uh, we became part of the training team, put together their programming for four months. And you train, I'm oh, sorry, um, we train them at Warner Brothers. So there's a huge like hangar that's made into a gym and there's a load of weightlifting equipment, a load of machines, some cardio, ski ergs, and then a big uh, like running track or a long sprint track. So all the equipment was there we could create the programming and we had 20 Amazons physically and then 20 Amazons online that um, we trained for background artist work and the girls would come in we set their programs worked out five days a week for four months we trained them in blocks like we would athletics um, so four weeks on three weeks hard with then a deload week Monday would be metabolic conditioning Tuesday would be Olympic lifting and track and field. Wednesday was uh, more of a body weight gymnastics day. Yeah. Thursday was a deload, yoga, um, meditation, stick mobility, more body weight. And then Friday, we were back into uh, Olympic lifts and sprint training. So then they could recover over the weekend. Very cool. And, and, and throughout this, the, you know, these are, were they already trained to some degree or are these people you found? Well, this, this was the challenge. Yeah, because a lot of them were uh, dancers. A lot of them were dancers. I think out of it, we had two athletes, but they one was still training or competing, so she would do her own thing. The other is an ex, uh, Olympic, ex -Olympic, athlete. Olympic athlete, so she did her own thing. But then it was trying to, I mean, although the dancers – had grace in the way they move when it came to running it was a different thing so yeah, yeah. it's trying to teach them or to refine the way they move to be able to like look like sprinters runners 400 meter runners whatever it may be um, but at the same time they still maintain the the dancing grace they could do things like a gymnast and you know so it was implementing all of those things and you know harnessing what they already had and making it better and you know to what you, we had on the screen with the with the amazons and we had this challenge of like an olympic athlete and then a 20 year old dancer that had never lifted a weight in her life yeah, yeah. and to bring them together aesthetically physically so each uh, actress had a different training program or a different length of training program mm. And then also to create that cohesion. So like a flow state on screen where they moved as a unit, like when you watch them run, it's because or sprint in the Amazon Olympics at the beginning of the film, we spent hours and hours and hours teaching them how to um, strike the ground or work their arm movement patterns or where their hips should be, as well as working on their course ability, their plyometric ability, their ability to swing on the bars. And then on top of that, because it was the Amazon Olympic competition, we wanted there to be competition between them. Um, so it was bringing the group cohesion as well as the flow state and all these incredible women together to like a physical peak that would translate to the audience. Very cool. And it, it, and it, it, it appeared to work very well. Uh, yeah. yeah, the feedback's been... Yeah. Like, yeah, I watched it with the kids it and it was there. Yeah, there was some... that. that Kind of opening scene with the with the Olympic kind of event is is pretty pretty cool. It gave um, us both yeah. such goose pimples. We were like, oh, <laughs> it's so amazing to watch. That's the, that's the thing though, because when you when you watch it live and the filming, um, you 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 don't really. I mean, you get the you get the buzz when it's there, and I mean, but when it's all edited together and it, you know, they they put the music and everything else, you're like wow, okay, you know, so the, the months of hard work and stress to get everybody to where they are has really paid off. And also we had to kind of bulletproof them and then with work with the stunt department. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you wanted to make sure that there was a lot of bounding over the posts and then they were working in sand. So we worked on their proprioception and their foot stability and knee stability and then removed knee valgus and worked on their glute strength and core strength. And it was that layering process mm -hmm but then also to get them to physically peak within their aesthetics and their movement patterns ready for filming. So it was like the Olympics were the Olympics mm -hmm. in terms of their programming. Very cool. Very and then, process. I'm sure a lot of people were really fascinated by that, 
that whole process and how that all, all went about. So how long did you have them before you actually started film? We had three months. Okay. Um, that was the longest programme for them. And then they went into the first phase of filming in London. And then we had about a three week period to peak them again, ready to go out to Fuerteventura to film um, all the sand scenes. Okay. So we almost we did two peaks and we worked with them for four to five months mm -hmm. total. Super cool. And then with Kristen, um, she came in two months before she started filming. Right. And when I talked to Patty about her transformation, we wanted to make her long and lean and like cat-like, but also to transform her physically and movement pattern wise as she was filming the movie. So at the beginning, she's kind of geeky, silly Barbara, who's a bit like floppy and not athletic. And by the end of the film, she's like a badass apex predator cheetah. And the idea was, within her programming and within the way that I trained her and the way the film was shot, that actually happened in real life. Like she became stronger and fitter and faster and more of a badass within her mentality, the way she trained, the way she moved. So the viewer could have this experience with her through the film because she had the experience herself in life over the nine months through the film. Very cool. So what, what's on the agenda now? So before we wrap up, what's, what's, what's cooking in your world? Right? Ooh, cooking. what's cooking? Um, so we, we to, to show there's some secret projects we're maybe not allowed to talk about, but uh, uh, well, that we can divulge. We started planning our wedding. <laughs> yes. That's it's it's, 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 it's undertaken it for 14 cool. years. Yeah, uh, that's <laughs> super cool. Uh -huh. yeah. We've been engaged for 10 years and we finally started to plan the wedding. So finally. In a Who's, couple leading of years time. Who's leading the wedding planning? The wedding planner. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> uh, okay, sensible. Because I, I think if it was down to both of us, it would be a nightmare. I like it. Like, at the moment, we, we're not even sure what colours. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we know there's sun. Uh, That's it. A, a little bit. So, we, right. we moved in to our place and we had an interior designer do everything because I don't know there's so many things out there and if someone just presents like this 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 or this and then we'd be like oh we love that let's yeah. go with that so I think that's the way yeah. forward so are there some <laughs> films are there films on them um yeah so I, I did a film called 400 bullets okay um yes yeah, a director called Tom Patton is a up-and-coming director very very good um and that film is coming out next month so i'm super excited by that so again i, I play a second that could have been released by the time this goes out so that's that's killed cool. 400 bullets is 400 that, bullets what channel are we is it net? Has it um been? no that's, that's going to be i think it's going to be amazon prime amazing cool so, so keep an eye out for that one yeah so that that's uh, that's exciting um got a new fitness series got a new fitness level series up. Yeah, Uncle that's Rocker. also yeah. spring, um, March, April. And uh, there's a thousand rep circuit in there with well, a hundred burpees. <laughs> I, um, I shall avoid that one. I know, yeah. no, you should try it. it. No, it's... no, do not. <laughs> so... you, you'll enjoy our positivity getting you through that workout. It's nothing. Yeah, hundred burpees. I don't fancy that one too much, but but yeah, that <laughs> be uh, yeah, my back would be in pieces on that one. <laughs> oh. um, I'm working on a TV series. Um, so in our industry, 83% of dieters fail. That's how unsuccessful most people are when they're trying to lose weight. And they found that if you are obese um, and through lockdown, you will have likely put on nine to 10 pounds. Okay. And it, actually, if you're at a healthy weight, you'll have probably lost five pounds throughout the whole pandemic. So unfortunately, the overweight individuals in our country are getting more overweight at the moment. And, and, and does that delve into kind of the psychology of it, the behaviours, the habits, and things like that? That would be cool. Yeah. So when, when is that airing? I, I, we're just working on the concept oh, okay. at the moment. That sounds so this, this is in the process. Uh, and then we've got another project, but we can't talk about it yet. Not yet. 
No, <laughs> I'm glad you actually had a project you couldn't talk about because that's <laughs> I like that. I like that mystery. I was hoping there yeah. was something in there. Yeah. Like, Enigma. But, something else but this is this is Jenny. Jenny really wants to tell you, but she can't. She's like, can't. guess what? I'm like, so with Jenny, if someone says, right, Jenny, I'm going to tell you something. It's really cool, but you can't tell anyone. I have to say, can you get her to shake hands or do a pinky promise mm -hmm. that she won't say? Because she walk away, she's like, ah. Um, Guess what? What? I'll, tell, I'll tell the dog. <laughs> well, guys, I, I've got a, I'm, We've been on here quite a long time. I'm going to let you come with your evening, um, whether Pooch needs a, a, a walk or anything like that. But hey, you are both of you incredible individuals, incredible couple. Uh, you know, fascinating stories and just oozing positivity. Yeah. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you for, you know, being involved and obviously, you know, telling your stories and being so, you know, open about everything. It's been been really cool. So thank you very much. No, thank, thank you for you. having us. Thanks for having us. And yeah. we, we will speak soon, no doubt. We will speak That's soon. you will. All right. Thanks, Thanks again. Take care. Take care. Thanks, Bill. Bye. Cheers. Bye.